Exactly how much more power does your car make in the winter versus the summer? We did some dyno testing and I'm gonna share that with you. And if you dyno test your car in the winter versus the summer, even with correction factors, does it show more power? I'm gonna share that information with you too. And most people know at least part of the reason why a car makes more power in the winter versus the summer. But I bet 99% of the people, 99.99% of the people out there don't know the entire reason why. And the entire reason why is really cool. And I'm gonna share that with you too. Like everything else we do here, I like to bring the receipts. In other words, I like to give you actual hard numbers. I'm not just some dude in front of a whiteboard pontificating and showing you things that I may have learned in a classroom somewhere. There are real numbers and there's real testing and I wanna share that with you. You know, generally with those types of people, when it comes time to do the practical stuff, they tend to fail miserably, like installing a supercharger, for example. I'm not calling anybody out, but it's kind of like watching a dog chew peanut butter. Speaking of which, this past weekend was Roger's birthday. You wish him a happy birthday if you'd like. Happy birthday, dear Roger. But anyway, we finally got a cold front through here where it hit a high of only 51 degrees during the day. It's 51 degrees Fahrenheit. Not sure what that translates to Celsius off the top of my head, but it's pretty chilly for down here during the day. We do hit freezing maybe once a year, but usually it's you know through the night. So we won't have that kind of opportunity during the day here. So we took advantage of it and we made some baseline dyno pulls the way we test all the time and this is going to take us into heavy data land so let's go to my desk and take a look at some data and some dyno pulse. As usual let's start with a baseline pull. Let's go back to the end of July where we did the baseline pull for the cheaper easier electric supercharger dyno test. Now Now let's take a look at the graph of that pull. So here it is, I'm zoomed in a little bit. Uh, you know, you can see here, we start at 250 horsepower and go up to 400 horsepower. And the RPM graph at the bottom starts at 4,000 RPM and goes up to 6,200 RPM. But you could tell it was a rather warm day that day. Uh, the dyno registered 95 degrees. Uh, and our baseline pull was 339.72 horsepower. So that was, you know, pretty good. And we tried to stay a little bit consistent. What's interesting on this pull though, is you'll notice that we were a little bit rich at 12 to one air fuel at about what was about peak horsepower. It was 5,520 RPM. Uh, we're just shy of that here. Let's see if I can get a little bit closer. It's a little twitchy. There we go. All right, same, same deal, you know, six of one. Right. So now let's skip ahead to the middle of September where we tested the big castle motor on the electric supercharger and let's take a look at that baseline pull. That even felt better. And now let's take a look at the numbers from that baseline pull. It's right here in brown. You can tell it was 91 degrees, still pretty warm. I mean, this is South Texas after all. And we were within 1.1 horsepower and within 100 RPM of peak. Again, zoomed in, nothing really to write home about. You'll notice the AFR is registering 10 to one. That's because we didn't actually have the O2 sensor hooked up for those pulls. But there you go, pretty consistent. One horsepower variation, and it was still freaking hot. So now let's skip ahead to early November when we did the compound electric supercharger test and let's take a look at that baseline pull. And now. And now let's look at the graph of that guy. So here it is in dark blue. And that was 338.06. So now we have a spread of 1.66 horsepower. Uh, it was a lot cooler. It was 83 degrees, at least by the dyno at that point. Um, AFR was 
it was a little bit leaner. It was closer actually to where it should be at 12.67 to 1. Not bad, but we are still pretty gosh darn consistent with the correction factors. You know, we have a spread of 1.66 horsepower. That doesn't suck. And where our horsepower peak occurs is pretty much right around the same area. So let's go now to sort of middle end of November, right before Thanksgiving, and let's take a look at when we did that air filter test and let's take a look at that baseline pull. Hit it. And let's look at the graph from that guy. So that one is gonna show up here in this sort of gray color. I know it's not really helpful, but that one came in at 338.7. So right pretty much in the middle of the pack. I mean, they're all right there. There really isn't much of a spread. So what are we learning from this? These are corrected numbers, obviously. They're SAE corrected numbers. Uh, air fuel, it's that one was a little bit lean, but there really isn't that much variation. If you're in the ballpark with air fuel, it's not going to change your power a lot. And it does vary, you know, throughout the RPM band a bit, as you can tell down here. So we were pretty much right on the money with all of these baseline pulls. But as I mentioned in the introduction, what happened when we did a baseline pull at 51 degrees? Again, we use the same technique, the same strapping, the same temperature sensor location, the same air pressure in the tires, the same everything. Let's take a look at what that looked like. All right, this one is in blue. This one made a little bit more power. This one is outside of our range. We put down 341.74 horsepower and the dyno registered 68.8 degrees Fahrenheit. It was really 51 degrees outside. So it was a lot colder. I mean, a lot colder. This 95 degrees that we saw way back in July, that was pretty accurate to the actual external temps. The temperature sensor is next to the rear of the car and it's kind of outside the flow of the air through the building, um, but it's still kind of in it, but kind of not. Uh, so, you know, if you keep everything consistent, this is still not a huge swing for a difference in temperature of 44 degrees outside. It was genuinely about 95, might have even been 96, 97 when we did this one in July. So let's say 45 degrees will definitely give us only a two horsepower swing if you keep everything consistent and you use the SAE correction factor. That's by the way, one of the reasons why they use the SAE correction factor. But now let's take a look at the horsepower difference between all of these baseline pulls without the correction factor. So we're gonna go in here to options and switch our correction factor to uncorrected. Hit apply, okay, let's take a look. Now our range is from 332 all the way up to 350. We can call this 333 basically. So you're talking about over a 17 horsepower swing. And from our coldest day where we made 350.63 horsepower to our hottest day where we made 333.42 horsepower, that is over 17 horsepower. That is a huge difference. And that's the kind of power you can expect when you see a 45 degree swing in temperatures outside. So yes, when your car does feel more powerful in the winter, it is more powerful in the winter. And of course, as I mentioned in the beginning, that is largely because cold air is denser. I think everybody knows that. But there's another cool factor at play, which the dyno cannot correct for. And what the dyno cannot correct for, and what most people don't know, is that the boundary layer changes. Now what the boundary layer is, is it's an area at the runner walls where there is turbulent flow, basically no flow, and it's not like boundary layer, no flow, and then there's tons of flow. That's not exactly how a boundary layer works. There's turbulent flow, no flow, and it kind of tapers off into flow. But what happens with colder air, colder air is less viscous. So the net effect of that air being less viscous is that the boundary layer actually thins out. And the net effect of the boundary layer thinning out is it makes your runners, like in your intake manifold and your cylinder head, appear slightly larger. And that has the effect of increasing the volumetric efficiency of your engine. And that makes a little bit more horsepower 
which is why the dyno can't really correct for that because it has no way of knowing the flow characteristics of the runners inside your intake manifold inside your cylinder head. And that's why you will actually make a little bit more power on the dyno anyway in the winter than in the summer. But it's not much. In this case, it's two horsepower. So that's something I bet you did not know. And that's one of the reasons why I think science and data are really freaking cool. I actually obviously really enjoy this. I'm such a nerd. Now we did do one other thing. We changed the way we dyno test. Now I did this because I wanted to see what the net effect would be. And besides which the air temperature sensor in our dyno room was not actually registering what was happening outside. It was 51 degrees and we were registering 68.8. So what we did is we opened the giant 14 foot roll up door in front of the dyno. Now it's a good 30 feet in front of where the car is. I wanted to see what difference that would make. So not only did we pull the car with the big roll-up door open, but we also stuck the air temperature sensor out on an aluminum yardstick out just a little bit. It doesn't have a terribly long cord, so we couldn't go very far just to try to get it out into the airflow a little bit more. But as I said earlier, there's, there's not a lot of airflow there. And what that really managed to accomplish is get it closer to the car where, you know, the car generates a lot of heat and there's fans blowing that heat back. So that was probably a negligible effect. But basically what the takeaway from this is we changed the way we dyno and then we pulled the car. Hit it. And what do you suppose happened there? Let's take a look at that graph. Uncorrected, because that's where we left off. 357.39 horsepower. We gained seven horsepower. That's a lot. But if we switch back to corrected, do you think it's gonna correct back down? Let's find out. Let's go back here to tools, options, switch back to SAE, apply, okay. Let's take a look. All right. So we look back here. This was our cold temperature baseline pull at 341. And this here was 347. So we picked up basically six horsepower, almost seven horsepower, but corrected six horsepower from opening the garage door and just changing the way that we dyno the car. That got me interested in wanting to look at what the manifold air temperature sensor read in the intake manifold. So if we look at the engine's data log from the first pull, it looked like this. So this is the pull right here. And let's take a look at what our averages and our minimums and maximums were. Particularly, I wanna look at the manifold air temperature. So it went from 88 to 98, right? And our average was 91.93, basically 92. Now, the pull with the door open, you would expect that number to be lower. And by the way, our spark advance was 26.50 because, hey, if we picked up power, I wanna know where it came from. So let's look at the, the door open one and look at about the same area. Our average mat was higher, it's 95.45. Again, as opposed to almost 92. So that's over three degrees higher. And our spark advance again was 26.50 and here it's 26.67. It's a little higher, but a tenth of a, of, of a degree, that ain't much. So what changed? Well, the only thing I can tell you as far as what changed is that we changed the way we dynoed. We moved sensors around. And even though the mat registered as higher, and it could be because that was the second pull of the day and there was more heat soak in the aluminum in the, in the intake manifold. And the manifold air temperature sensor in a Fox body is in the lower intake manifold, so it's gonna read higher. Uh, the thermal couple inside the sensor may be heat soaking from the intake manifold itself, or it may be in the boundary layer, even though it's a thinner boundary layer as we learned, but it could still be in that boundary layer, but it could be sucking in much colder air and the car is just not seeing it, uh, which brings up the logical question, was the air fuel substantially different between the two? Let's clear all this stuff out except for those two poles and see. Now, the air fuel was very similar between the two, as you can see, but the power was definitely there. 
It was definitely acting as though it was much colder. So that is a bit of a mystery. But the key takeaway with this one is that we changed the way we dynode and that changed the numbers much more so than temperature did with correction. Now there's one other thing I did want to touch on. There's, there's a classic rule of thumb that every 10 degrees Fahrenheit will change the power output of your engine by 1%. Let's see if that holds true. Let's clear out the, the open door thing and let's leave our cold baseline and let's go to our hottest baseline. And these are what those two graphs look like. Okay, and we wanna look at uncorrected numbers. So right now we're corrected to SAE, so let's switch back to uncorrected. All right, so uncorrected, it was 333 versus 350. That is a difference of 17 horsepower, 17.2, but who's really counting? Let's call it 17 horsepower. Let's see, and the difference in ambient temperature, because this was just sensor temperature, but I do know that the difference in ambient temperature was 45 degrees. Let's see if that rule of thumb holds true. So that 45 degrees would translate to a 4.5% difference in power. Now there's two ways to look at it. We could take that 350, let's take the 350, and multiply it times 95.5, which would be 0.955. That gives us 334.25. Hey, check that out, we're within a horsepower. That rule of thumb holds true, at least that way. Let's take a look at it in the other direction. So if we take 333 and multiply that times 1.045, 347, let's call it 348. So we're, you know, within two and a half, three horsepower in the other direction. So it works better the other way, but the rule of thumb is accurate. For every 10 degrees of Fahrenheit and difference in ambient air temperature, assuming things like barometric pressure and humidity, and by the way, if we look at that here, barometric pressure is pretty darn close and humidity is also pretty darn close. Thankfully, the weather here is very consistent. It's pretty much the same. So, you know, isn't data cool? I'm such a nerd! I think this stuff is really, really neat. So as per usual, thanks for coming along on this uh, deep data dive. And you know, if you knew about the boundary layer thing before this video, let me know in the comments below and let me know how you knew about this thing. And if this kind of thing, you know, Float your boat. We're doing a lot of cool stuff. We have some collaborations coming up and some other fantastic, you know, electric supercharger tests and other cool stuff. Please subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. Of course, that helps with everything because this happened. Here's your moment of Simon. Simon's a sweet power cat. With the correction factors. Well, I'll share that with you he too. Thinks I'm very and dull. I bet you know one of the major reasons why the card. I'm here to serve. serve. His every whim He likes to be scratched Behind the ears And he likes to be scratched On his throat But that feels a little weird But he's ow, still ow, ow, a hey, fast furry predator Of which he feels the need to remind Stop it, psycho. <laughs> you like that, huh? Okay, bait it. This might also be a moment of Simon at the end of the video. <laughs> like he left tooth marks, man, deep ones.